souls in danger look above Jesus completely saves he will lift you by his love out from the angry waves he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be be saved got your Bibles, Titus chapter 2. Now don't worry, I, I've been told by family members not to show the picture of the bear again. So if you remember, we're going back, we've been interrupted, I'm going through having a, the formula for a godly family, we've looked at some, some things and we're getting down to, to today, we're going to be looking at uh, the young women and uh, the importance of having uh, godly young women in the church and uh, in a family. And uh, as I said, I used to have the picture up there of the bear, remember the bear? The Cretans, they were just bears. They were just, they look cuddly, but don't, don't get the bear angry, okay? And when the bear's hungry, you better get out of its way. That's what the Cretans were. And so that was the, the family picture was like these people. So that's what Titus had to work with. And that's what uh, the Apostle Paul in, chap, in chapter 2, and through the whole chap, the, the, all three chapters. And I encourage you to read it. Uh, Titus, if you haven't already, is get into it all because there's so much there, but especially chapter 2 where it talks about the family, and later on it also talks about servants in the household and stuff as well. But I just want us to focus on this family unit. So Titus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men, and we've looked at that, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity, and in patience, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine. And again, that much wine is talking about wine that they were able to filter down so they could drink much of it and drink it uh, throughout the, the evening on, on all these parties they had, they hosted. Teachers, and here's where I want us to look at, and we'll look at this later on, teachers of good things. And I kind of left off on that a few weeks ago. But what I'm going to really hammer on is verses 4 and 5. And that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again, Lord. I thank you for a church family, but I also thank you for the individual families that make up a church. So many dynamics, so many things that go on into into a church and the, the living organism that, that Jesus Christ has in, in his local churches in this area. And I, I think specifically, and I pray for us here at Forest City, Lord, that you would help us to get into your word, help us to find out what you want us to be. Whether you're an aged man or a younger man or, or an aged woman or a younger woman, Lord, what do you want us to be? Help us to surrender and submit to your will that we may be blessed and that the world through us might be blessed as well as they see Jesus in our lives. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. So, I've always started off, I said, who wants to be a part of a godly family? Most people would say, yeah. I mean, I don't, especially if you're a Christian, yeah, I wish some of us didn't have godly families, okay? I didn't have a bad family. I just never had a born-again family when I grew up. So I wish, yeah, we could go back to that, but I, I can't go back there, but I can start from here, and I can work on things from here. And, uh, I mean, you can always keep working on things. As long as there's a breath of life, God's got you down here, and God can still uh, use you and work with you and transform you. And this epistle was written, as I said, by the Apostle Paul, and it was written to a, not a church, okay? It was taught, written to a particular person, and his name was Titus. And he said, I want you to stay there, Titus, and I want you to do the role of a pastor in that area, and I want you to get these people together, and I want you to, I want you to work with the family units that you got there, okay? And we've done some ministry, people got saved, baptized, you got a group here, and I want you to work on them. And he says, later on, he says, I also want you to ordain other men in other parts of that island, and I want other churches to be sprouting up, and I want them to, to be in this pattern. So he says here, he starts talking about... Um, that they had to work, he goes, Paul said, I know what you have to work with, 
Okay, these are not the easiest people. Okay, they weren't uh, they weren't raised in, in Judaism. They didn't they weren't raised with the Old Testament scriptures. They weren't raised with strong uh, formal families and stuff of that nature. These people you, now you're getting more and more into the Greek culture, and so the, the, a lot of this stuff is foreign to them. So you got to start with the rudimentary parts, the fundamentals. You got to work with these people. And uh, he says, starts there. He says, I want you to start off with the preacher, uh, with the pastor. And verse 1, it says, but speak thou the things that which become sound doctrine. We looked at that. Is that if you want good sound doctrine, you need to know what the Word of God says, and you need to be able to preach it and teach it to other people. Titus was such a man. He goes, first of all, he goes, because, and we'll go to the next, uh, next slide there. We'll get over there. We'll start with the preacher. And so the next one, if you just hit that again, there we go. It does work, okay? And that is, he says, I want you to speak the sound doctrine to the aged men. Let's start, let's start with the senior guys first, okay? The problem is in a lot of churches where, where you, get, you get kids, you get women and children in the churches. He goes, but I want you to start with those. I want you to shake up those older guys, all right? So he's not talking, you know, he's not talking to Doug and Rod. He's leaving you guys alone. You're the young guys, okay? It's the old guys. That he wants, but he's shaking up. He goes, I want you to deal with those older fellows first. The guys that are mature have been around for a while. And he goes, just because they're aged and stuff like that doesn't mean they know it all. He says, they got some things. So he, he started going through. He goes, they, they need to be sober. They need to be grave, temperate, uh, sound in faith, and, and sound in charity, and sound in patience. So there's some, a light itemized list we looked at before. If we go to the next slide. He's, then he's supposed to. Let's talk to the aged women. He's, when he's preaching, he's ministering. He's also, go to the men first, the aged men. Let's get them in order. And he says, but don't, now you've got to go to the aged women too. And there's some things that he wanted them to do. And they were to be, uh, they were to be uh, behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers. And we looked at that last time. And that meant uh, not like devils, deceivers, the people that, that try, to, to try to stir up trouble and uh, accuse people. And he says, uh, not given uh, to much wine. And as we said, they were the entertainers in the home. And it was common on that island. They were evil uh, uh, beasts. And they were uh, slow bellies. And they, they liked their parties and stuff. He says, you make sure that they get rid of that stuff. And then he said, and we, we jumped off this real quick. But at the end of that last sermon there, I was preaching on. He says, teachers of good things. Teachers of good things. And, and today we're, gonna, we're going to link this quality of the aged women to the younger women. Okay, because if you hit the next slide there, you'll find that this is interesting. Is that the preacher, he's supposed to teach and he's supposed to train the aged men. He's supposed to teach and train the aged women. But he's not supposed to teach and train the younger women. Isn't that interesting? Who teaches the younger women? The aged women. So, Titus, don't worry about the younger women. You work on sound doctrine. Okay, getting into the Word of God, sound doctrine to these aged women in the church. These are born again Christians, and, and get them to, to, to in the whole thing. When you when I look look at this list here about uh, uh, behavior that becometh holiness, uh, not false accusers, not given to much wine. Why? All that was leading up to this: that they may be teachers of good things, that they may be able to teach these younger women. It's kind of interesting. All of this was. He goes, I want you to teach those aged women so that they can be teachers of the younger women. And it's true, the Bible does not want a woman to teach a man in the church. That's what it says. Uh, especially when it has to do with doctrine and stuff of that nature. And people say, okay, then the women are kind of off to the side. No, 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 no. Because you've got to have all these younger women. They need to be taught. And guys, hands off. That's up to the aged women to teach. So they have a role, a big responsibility, a lot. This is all foreordained here and listed out by God. So teachers of good things and, that, and things uh, that are good quality. And uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much that we could talk about there. But if you go to the next slide there, and I want us to see something here. And that is, there's a very popular Bible chapter in the Bible. And that's uh, found, if you take your Bibles over to Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman. Proverbs 31, and I'll show share with you in just a moment why I, I'm just kind of diverting over there. Uh, because as it describes this virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, uh, it's leading up to this description, uh, or leading up to this description is an insight by an aged woman who teaches her son lessons on how to find such a woman. So in Titus, the aged women are to teach 
the younger women. But we also find back here in uh, about a thousand years before that, that's when Proverbs was written, we find uh, that the aged woman here in King Lemuel's life also taught him. So he, the aged woman taught, taught is to teach the younger women, but we go back to the Old Testament, we see, we see an instance here where uh, a king, when he was younger, was taught by his mother. So verse 1, it says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. All right, so here we find that the age of women play a very important role in teaching. And that, that word taught in, in Proverbs there means to instruct, uh, to morally instruct with discipline and with correction. And she was the one that would kind of cuff him across the head, you know. And if you got a good mom, guys especially, and your mom has cuffed you across the side of the head, either literally or proverbially or however you want it, metaphorically, however, it's good because she cares about you and she's looking out for you. She knows what's going on. And it's like, son, smarten up, yeah. smarten up. And so King Lemuel, he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this down. And he says, yeah, I, you know what? I was taught some things, this prophecy from my mom. And uh, this, this moral instruction. And before we, so before we learn that the aged women are to teach the younger women, we find that they also instruct their sons at times. And here's an example. Uh, even uh, the younger virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 is a teacher. If you look there at verse 26, Proverbs 31, verse 26, talking about the, he, this is the, the kind of woman that's being described and, and taught to King Lemuel to, to find this type of woman. And he says, this is the kind of woman you want. Verse 26, she opened her, th her mouth. Oh, women can't open their mouths. They got to be dumb, don't they? Not according to the Bible. I'll tell you, there's scripture after scripture after scripture about that, but it's controlled by God. Uh, okay, it says she opened up her mouth with wisdom. Okay, and that's the thing. She's a godly woman. She's a woman of virtue. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. Okay, so again, it's not a woman that's instructing and teaching men the word of God, but she has a major purpose. And he, in the, the mom's saying, King Lemuel, this is the kind of woman you need to find. You need to find this woman. Yeah, she's not one just that shuts up her mouth and stands behind her man and says whatever. No, this is a woman that when she speaks, she speaks the wisdom of God. She speaks from the, what God's put in her heart. And she has these words of wisdom. And it, 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 when I look at that, I'm thinking, yeah, you know what? It's, they say behind every uh, successful man is a woman. I, I believe that a lot. I mean, I know with my own self. I mean, without my wife, I would, I, I'd be a mess. It, it's, um, I, I just... I, the, the, the value, I can't, I can't express enough the value of women. Even my mom, in, in, you know, when, when I was young growing up, what she had to put up with, with me. And if you're going through some problems with your kids or your grandkids and stuff like that, you just hang in there, okay? Because I'll tell you something, uh, I let you in on a secret, 95% of the preachers were brats when they were kids, and they drove their moms crazy into tears a lot of times. But praise God. God just kept working with these women. They taught them. So we see this. So, so a, woman, a woman of virtue is not one, someone who's to be trivialized by the so-called man's world. She is to be listened to and honored. Look there at verse 28, Proverbs 31, 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praiseth her. Oh, that's something we don't do enough of, I don't think, praising our wives. He praises her. Okay, so find some good quality, something great that your wife has done and encourage her and praise her for. And even the children, this is, a, this is a working on the children, is don't be such brats. Be thankful. Let us be thankful. And I know I'm not teaching to a lot of young children today, but if I was, is this is a command of God, is to recognize that you've got, uh, you got a, a mom who's a virtuous woman, and you should be thankful for that. Well, she won't let me do that. You should be thankful she don't let you do everything you want to do. Because if you get to do everything you want to do, you're going to be destroyed real quick. So here's the other thing. If you go back up to the verse 10, Proverbs 31, verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Mm, that's why I got that picture up there, rubies. Uh, now, I've, I've, heard this, I've read this verse many times, but it never occurred to me to consider its literal teaching before. So, until now that is, so how much is a ruby worth? How much is a ruby worth? Well, I, as I, I look at this, uh, one carat of ruby is about 200 milligrams. So follow me through on this. 
One carat of rubies worth, uh, is about 200 milligrams, and there's 450,000 milligrams in a pound. Now, using today's value, you see, I'm a literalist. I want to know what the Bible says there. She's worth rubies, okay? According to today's value, if you have a woman who weighs 150 pounds, that's equivalent to a ruby of four, 340 thousand one hundred ninety five carats and at a top price you can get a a, a, uh, the, a carat of ruby can go from about a hundred bucks to fifteen thousand if she's worth fifteen thousand per carat that means that she, if you have a virtuous woman the bible says that pound per pound and if she's about 150 pounds she's worth five billion one hundred and two million nine hundred twenty five thousand dollars if she's in her weight in rubies I mean, I got looking at that and I'm thinking, wow, now if she weighs more than 150 pounds, whoa, <laughs> think how rich you are, man. And if you convert it to Canadian dollars, okay, that was going into the American. So you say, well, why did you do that? Because what, I think what you, if you hit the next button there, what, what, what the, the mom is trying to say to King Lemuel when he was younger, she's priceless. You can't put a value on her. Are you kidding me? If you, if you get a, a woman who's virtuous, a woman who who's list, tch, 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 ticks off these, these items here, she's priceless. You better treasure her, okay? And so I got looking at it. So King, uh, King Lemuel's uh, mom taught, taught him well. And godly women in the Bible uh, were val- very valuable as teachers to their sons. And uh, uh, now let's fast forward again back a, a, a thousand years. Let's go back to, to first, uh, or I'm sorry, Titus, Titus chapter two, where we were, and let's look now. That's that's a woman instructing her son, but let's look at how women are to instruct their daughters on a regular basis here. This is a key issue. So again, in verse four, Titus chapter two, verse four, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient. To their own husband, that the word of God may uh, may be may not be may be not blasphemed. I'm sorry. So the first thing here we see here is that they're to be sober, sober, and that really means uh, th- that's really an action. That's that transition from the the senior woman to the younger woman is that that process of making sure that they're sober, and it's a process of uh, restoring one to one's senses to have a a moderation, to have control, to curb uh, one's desires, uh, to, to be disciplined, uh, to, to hold to one's duties. And that, that's a transition, again, from the senior woman to the younger woman, because if they don't get this right, okay, if they don't get this right and they don't get discipline in their lives, these younger women, then the rest of the categories aren't going to happen. It's not going to happen. They have to have a, sen- a common, common sense. And I tell you something, this is a work, and I'll, I'll be praying for you people. You have children, you have, uh, you have young ladies. Uh, I'll be praying for you because the world wants to destroy everything that's going to be said here. Okay? They're against this. Yeah. And so uh, we have to be very careful because uh, we're in this world of no discipline. Uh, the second one, uh, if you go there, and that is, you see there, uh, they are to love their husbands. And now, of course, not all women are going to be married. Not all men are going to be married. As Paul wrote, uh, he said, man, I wish that nobody got married just so we could just dedicate ourselves to God. And sometimes there are eunuchs in this world that are forced to be that way, some by choice, because they just choose not to have a woman in their life. And the same thing with a woman. They don't have to be. But I tell you, the norm is, the, the general plan is for a woman to be married. Now, if she's going to be married... Let's make sure, and this is for the older women. So I'm instructing the older Okay, if you're a younger woman, don't listen to me. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your moms, okay? And older women in the church, that they can have an influence on you. All right? And here's the things. And this is all for older women to teach younger women. Love their husbands. And this is a, an intimate kinship with uh, the, the young woman's spouse. She is to fo- uh, foster this feelings of, of closeness uh, it's, uh, that, that solely focuses upon her husband. It's a notion that he is her man and she is his woman. That they're going to, and it's, uh, and this is something you're going to see all the way by. It, it has to do with guarding. The, she has to be the guardian. She has to make sure that this is, this, uh, relationship sticks. It implies this intimacy that is reserved only for the man in her life. And we have a lot of masses going on today in churches. Not just the world, churches. We have a lot of people, and they're just hooking up, and there's disasters going on in Christian churches today. Used to be the world, a little bit in the church. Well, now we're almost mirroring the world. Okay, so this is something we have to work on. But again, it's not for me to do. It's for the senior women in the church 
to do with the younger women, to teach them by example and by instruction. Even if you've had a bad example, say, please learn from my, my mistakes. There's things, you, ladies, you have more power than I do, okay? And they'll listen to you. The, the, if I was to talk to a young lady, they should just feel icky and awkward about these things. Let the women teach the younger women about this, okay? So love their husbands, okay? Uh, now, if you've got your Bibles, let's look over to Mark chapter 10. There's just going to be just a couple passages more I'll, I'll divert from, but Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now, of course, if you're an evolutionist, you're going to strike this out and throw it out. And again, there are a lot of churches that do not believe in the six literal days of creation. So you can just, if you're one of those Christians, you can just cross that out and say, nah, the Holy Spirit didn't say that. But if you're wise and you believe in God, and you have faith in God, you believe that God created in six literal days, and you get back to the creation, look at verse 6. From, uh, okay, from the beginning of the creation, at the very, very beginning, God made them male and female. No other option. Okay? Now, that's not, of course, my sermon today, but there's no other option there. I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry, it's not, and it's not popular in churches anymore. It's that I see this wave going on in churches that all things are relative. No, God says not all things are relative. I have a plan. Now, you can do whatever you want with yourself, your bodies, and everything else, and you can convince yourself otherwise. You know, we can't all look at the screen and say that this is all black, but it's white. I'm sorry, folks. Let's call it for what it is. But the, it, so anyway, so I get, get back in there, okay, male and female, and for this cause, okay, so there's a reason for male and female. Did you ever notice that? Because he created the angels too. They're servants of God. They're children of God too. You, you, there's passages that refers to them as being children of God. And I think, but they're angels. But they don't have genders. Why do we have genders? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked me that. Why do we have genders? Well, right here in verse 7. I didn't know we had to actually write this down, but God felt that there would be a time when we would need this information because we would become dumb. Verse 7. For this cause. Why is there a male and female? For this cause. Okay? Shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife? Why, what cause? Because he's a guy and she's a girl. You don't need any other reason, folks. Okay? And the Bible says so. You don't need any other reason. This is God's plan. This is God's design. You're not an angel, okay? So if you say, well, you know, hey, Dad, I, I think uh, there's something wrong with me. Why? What's the matter, son? I'm attracted to, to girls. Oh, that's normal, son. Take him to this verse for this cause. You see, you're a boy. She's a girl. You should be attracted to her after you get past the icky stage and the fact that they all got cooties. There comes a time when the girls lose the cooties and all of a sudden things change. That's normal, okay? It's normal. It's good. It's healthy. It's nothing wrong. It, it, it's, it, that's, but again, that's why we have to curb these, the cur curb our appetites and stuff, but it's normal. Just don't let Satan get in there and mess it all up. For this cause, shall a man leave his... No, the, the wife doesn't leave. It's the man. The man's got to get to a point where he leaves mom and dad and gets his wife and cleaves to her. And he says, that's one flesh. Verse 8, and they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain. They're not two, but one flesh. And that's why I keep fighting over and over and over again. And, and, and is that we have, so again, and I'm, I can understand there might be times when you might want a prenuptial agreement if you've got $5 billion and I don't know, there's other investors involved or something like that. But under normal circumstances, why would you have a prenuptial agreement? You're one flesh. What you have is hers now. And if you're not willing to give that up, then you're not really willing to get scripturally married. Okay, because you're one flesh now, and you got to cut ties with mom and dad, okay? That doesn't mean you don't love them, you don't look after them, because you better. I'll tell you something, even Jesus hanging on the cross, looked down to Mary and saw his mom there, and, uh, uh, and said to John, behold thy mother. You look after her now. I have to go and, and be God here. I have to, do, I have to die for the sins of the world. I gotta, he knew what he had to do. He said, I'm not going to leave that woman without. She gave birth to me. She's my mom in the flesh. You look after her. So no, no, not saying don't look after mom and dad, but just saying that the, the primary relationship here is for a man to leave them and to cling on to his wife. And it says, what, uh, in verse 9, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man uh, put asunder. Well, there's a lot of men trying to put a lot of things asunder here these days. Now notice from Christ's teaching in Mark that the primary human-to-human -human relationship is the marriage. 
Okay, that's the number one. That's the, that, that relationship with somebody else. The, the closest you can possibly get with someone, scripturally speaking, is, is in this marriage relationship. There is no greater earthly union than holy matrimony. And, and notice uh, also that it is designed by God. And that it was laid down at the very beginning. It says there in the beginning of creation. This is not something he added later. There's some things that God added later. It was all part of his plan, but he added them here and there and later. Not this. This was at the very beginning. That's why when he created Adam, he created him alone. He wanted Adam to discover that he needed a help me. He needed a partner in life. He wanted him to self-discover right at the very beginning. What's the first thing that, 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 uh, that this man needs, that Adam needs? He realizes, he's looking around, he says, I don't have what the other animals have got out there. He says, I don't have a help me. Good, I want you to understand that. You need a woman, Adam. You need a woman. And uh, so we, we see that there. Now, go over to 1 Peter, and I want to combine this to something else. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter, near the end of the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Talking about the beginning of time. God has a plan. God has a timetable. And we see it again in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by traditions from, from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Here it is, verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And so what I want you to get from this passage is that God does have a timetable. God has a plan. And one of the things he planned, right, even before he spoke anything into existence was he already had the plan, he had the arrangement with God the Son, that he, everything that was going to transpire. He was already slain. He was already a dead man before God created man at all. Jesus was a dead man. This was all part of God's plan. Nothing takes him by surprise. That's why one of the reasons we should be in the will of God, because he knows what's going on when we don't. Okay? He oversees everything. He knows the number of the hairs in your heads. He knows how many sand is on the beaches of the, along the seaside. He knows everything, okay? So he knows this all. This was all planned. That was his timetable. So we see that at the, before the creation, he said, I'm going to have my son, and he's going to be slain for the sins of man. But I wanted to parallel that to you, what we just read over the remark, and that is the fact that also right soon after that, God created male and female, and that his desire was that they be married, okay? And that that, that relationship, that was, that's a funda what I'm saying is both of those principles are fundamentals to life. We need a Savior, and men and women are to get married. That, those are fundamentals. There's just man, there's just woman, and they're, they're the only ones that are to get married. Not woman and woman, not man and man, not, not some kind of half, half, I don't know, scalpel person that's transforming over. No, man, male, female. He created you one or the other. And there's, these, are, these are so fundamental. The reason I'm bringing it out is that just as fundamental as our salvation is, so is sexu human sexuality. So don't play around with it. Don't mess around with it. Don't let the world get into the church. Don't let the world get into your head. Don't, don't care about what these doctors and professors and everybody else say. Let me tell you something. According to the Word of God, they are messed up. And this was society. What a messed up society we have. Get back to the fundamentals. Now I'm going to Tie this all back to this as we look here. Where go back, you can go back to Titus chapter 2. It says that these, these, these young women are to be taught by the older women to love their husbands. To love their husbands. This is a fundamental value. This is something, this is near and dear to God's heart. It's not just a little add on, it's not something, it's, it's something that was really put down there as a foundation stone. Right after salvation. He had this idea for mankind, for man and a woman to be male and female to marry. Not like the angels. We're different than the angels that way. It's kind of amazing when you look at it this way. So what I'm saying to you is the elder women, if you teach the younger women that they are to love their husbands, that means love their husbands. And that's a, it's a filial love. It's not an agape love, like a godly love. It's that, that, that kinship where you make sure that you're so close together and you, you know your husband so well and that you're so dedicated to him. You love him because of that. And then the next thing is right after that, and this won't take so long, and that is love to, to, they're to love their children. They're to love their children. And this command is exactly the same as the preceding one, except instead of matrimonial, it's maternal. He goes, I want you to have that same type of love, that same kind of guarding. 
And this is the thing that you're going to see that theme through this. For the senior women are to teach the younger women to guard things. There's some things entrusted to these women, and, and they're guarding. You've got to guard your man. You better watch where your man's going, what he's thinking, what he's doing. You make sure that you, you've got his heart, and he has your heart. Cling to, don't let anybody drive a wedge. Don't you give any, don't you give any permission. Don't you give any, any leniency anywhere where, where somebody else can come in and mess up that. You guard that relationship. And then he said, turns around and says, likewise with your children. Love your children. Okay, you don't, I mean, there's times I know I understand that. I, I was raised next door when my brother was dying of cancer. My parents had to send me over to another home uh, to, to be looked after. I understand that. But they were always, even when they sent me to some place else to, to be looked after, they made sure that they were godly people. By the way, they're the ones that got me on that Sunday school bus when I was a kid and I got saved. And I praise God for that. And then I got saved and I was able uh, 45 years later to get my mom saved. So it worked around. But she started, what I'm saying is that my mom, even then, she, she and my dad and, and the turmoil they had as my, as my brother was dying of cancer, as they're looking after him, they also had a much younger son, which was me, and they made sure that I was looked after too. And they found a place for me. So yes, but in all of this, the whole thing is love. Ken, get to know your kids. Get to understand your kids. Get to know guarding. This, it's a sense of guarding. And, and it's something that, uh, that, that we've let go of so many times. Next one, discreet. Discreet. And it, it is interesting that this is, uh, is from the exact original words that, uh, in the Greek that you would find for a bishop in 1 Timothy that, uh, that, uh, that he uses another English word, but Bishops are to be discreet as well. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 2, uh, the aged men are to be discreet as, as well. There's something that God wants the young women to be like, and that means that discreet means to be self-controlled. Pastor must be self-controlled in his passions. Aged men must be self-controlled in their passions. And specifically speaking, the young women are to be self-controlled in their passions. It's, kind of, it's the same exact word. You won't see it in, in the King James, but you'll see it in the Greek. The same word. My goodness, there's, there's so much responsibility placed on young women. And I think that's really why it's up to the, the aged women to teach them and to really and show them by example and, and to really pray for them and speak to them on a regular basis. It's so important what God wants for, for women and womanhood. Um, so they're to be discreet and um, self-controlled. And they're, they're, I mean, really, if there's a spot, we have so much lack of, of discretion today. Reality shows and what you see on that and uh, in social media, people are putting sin on parade. And it's the, generally it's the young women that are doing it. They're taking pictures of themselves either naked or half naked. They're doing things and they're, they're broadcasting them out there. And then they have all these, these flop shows, uh, flop houses and all this so-called reality TV. It's reality, all right. It's talking about the sin of man. And it just promotes it. And uh, a lot of our young people are getting taken and swept up with that stuff. And their lives are being ruined. And it, it, so this is, this, is a, a, this is something that the older women are to tell the younger women, be discreet, control yourself, watch what you're doing here. Don't follow the world. Godly shame is in short supply these days. Then he says the next one, chaste, and that means to be pure from carnality, modest. And if it's a, a young woman who's not married yet, and that means she's supposed to be and maintain her virginity, work for virginity. And that th this is something that, uh, again, these are th th that's become a dirty word nowadays. Yeah. You know, if, if you're, I mean, there's people who, who if you were at the, the water cooler in the office building or something like that, talking, everybody's sleeping around with everybody on the weekend. They're talking about it on Monday and everything else. Some people are sleeping with each other on, in their offices. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the mess it was. Now, if you were to go back several, several generations, it wasn't like that at all. If it was, it was kept a secret or something like that. It was something to be ashamed of. Now, it's, now if you're, now if you're the, the type of person that's chaste and pure, now they try to make you feel ashamed. Let me tell you something, and this is for the older women to teach the younger women again. It, it, that, that, that kind of purity, okay? And if they have been, if they have, uh, uh, been sleeping around, they can, they can turn that and stop that right there, you see, and you need to teach that to, to young women, is that you can get your, your, your respect, your godliness back at any time. God's waiting for you at any time. But this is something that we always have to work at. This is not something to be ashamed of, that you're pure, that, that, that you're godly. Uh, I mean, but that's what the world wants you to think. Carnal living ha has, um, uh, has always, I mean, it's always been in vogue, but I noticed in the last 60 years it's become prominent. 
back in the 60s. I remember when they started, uh, there was a time when people started wearing certain clothes. And in the 60s, I noticed they started bringing in the mini skirts and hot pants toward the end of the, the time and all that stuff. And what happens, the women now, you see, because the, they had a birth control pill and they couldn't get pregnant, so uh, they could take these pills and then the abortion was more uh, available and all these things so they could, they, they could live like the guys. And so the guys are bad enough. And then these g- girls were living like the guys, and they were dressing prov- provocatively, and then everybody was sleeping with everybody, and everything was going on. And you can see that in the 1960s. Yeah. I challenge you, you watch it. Well, don't, you don't have to do it because I said so, but if you watch the TV show in 1961, then look at, sh- at a TV show in 1969. The hair on the men changed. Yeah. The men become looking like women. The women start looking like guys, or at least they're more provocative, showing themselves. And, and you see, so it's always existed, but I've just noticed in the last 60 years, especially at that flip in the 60s, you have to turn somewhere, and that was really where a big turn was, is that we've changed our society. So the society's not with us anymore. It's against us, and it's hard to be a Christian today. It's easier, if, I guess maybe if we lived in the 1800s, it would have been easier under, under Victorian rule or something to, to live a certain godly life. You didn't even have to be saved. You could put on the outward appearance of it. But now, when a person chooses to live for God, you stick out like a sore thumb because people see you're different. But you know what? In season or out of season, I'm supposed to preach the truth, and we're all supposed to live it. So this is something we're, okay, chaste, chaste. Um, God is eternal, therefore don't, don't, Go with trends, because trends won't last, okay? And uh, boyfriends won't last either, but God is eternal. So let's go by his unchanging standards. The next thing, we'll just keep moving. Oh, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, we'll be out by 2.30. Uh, I know we will. The next one, we're getting there. There's eight of them, man. We're at number six now. Keep keepers at home. Now, this phrase is most interesting. It's a most interesting one to me anyway, because it comes from, it's a phrase, keepers at home. It comes from just one word, but that one word is made up of two smaller words. It's a compound word. So they took, uh, God took two words uh, and crammed them together to make one word. And then when we translate it in English, we put it into a phrase, keepers at home. The, the one part of that, that uh, smaller word of that compound word, it, it just simply means house or home. It's, just, it's used in the Bible all over the place. It just talks about your house or home, keepers at home. But what I find interesting is that second word. That's the interesting part because it's not used anywhere in the Bible at all. Nowhere. Not by itself. And it's only used here when it's in combined with the home. It's a word that means, and you have to look at it through, uh, not through Scripture, but uh, in Greek words outside of Scripture. It means this. It means to be a guard, to be on one's guard, or to be ready. The older women were to train the younger women how to be guardians of the home. And that's what I said. If you look at all these things, it's guarding, guarding your relationship with your husband, with your children. Guard, guard, guard. Be on guard. Who's the guardian of the home? It's the woman. And, uh, I mean, when you look at this, they're the gatekeepers of the household. It is God's prime directive that the wife be the one watching it's entrusted to her. Watch out for your home. Oftentimes the father, you know, he'll come home from work. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but guys have a problem of multitasking. We're kind of limited in this area. And it's, it's, it's a common thing, okay? And I know some guys are better at it than others, but most of us can we only do like focus on one or two things at a time. And so we're just like, this, 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 this. Whereas women are more multitaskers. And I've seen this in my life. They're just able to think of, I don't know how their brains work, actually. I never figured out a woman's <laughs> brain. But it, it's not like mine. But they're able, they're able to observe things and pick up these, these small little nuances and stuff. And so when the dad comes home from work and, and stuff and he's, he's doing this and the, the, the wife's either at home or she, maybe she's come out from, from work too. The, the, the wife, the woman, she, she, and you're sitting at the supper table and maybe one of the children are kind of quiet, unusually quiet. It might go over the guy's head, you know, because he's talking about his day, because he's a guy, right? It's all about me. Let me tell you what I did today. La, 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 la. And it's stuff like that. It's, it's about him. But quite often it's the woman that's looking around and saying, uh, Johnny over here, he's unusually quiet today. What's wrong? And she'll pick up on things. She's the guardian. She knows these things. She sees things that we uh, as guys can't see. And God's putting it right down here that, it, that it's so important for us to be the, the keepers at home, or there to be the keepers at home, to be the guardians, the one that can guard, that can see things that the man can't see, that seems to elude us. Um, and and it, so God's commanding the aged women here to instruct their daughters on how to make good use of God's gift that God has naturally given them. 
So this is something to be looking at. Being a housewife, by the way, is not a dirty work. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Doesn't mean, actually, that you'll find there with Lydia, and so there's samples uh, of, of actually some women who handled the, the office of queen and stuff, and that, and that nature, you find that a woman can do many things. She can work outside the home, and she can do a lot of things. It's an amazing thing. But, according to God, her primary focus is the home. Not Mike McDonald saying, that's what God says. Keepers at home. They have to be the stewards. They have to be the ones that are ultimately responsible for the workings of that house. Is it working? Is it working? Of course, if the woman can't be there, the man has to step up. Maybe she's sick or ill or on vacation or something. But he's got to step up. But overall, it's the woman's responsibility. This is a major responsibility. Because it's the family unit that gets the society to function. Without family units, our society is a mess. And if you go into those neighborhoods where they have gangs, why do they have gangs? There's no mystery why there's no gang. I look at, where's the dad? Dad's not there. Maybe the mom's not there. But I'll tell you one thing. Somebody's not there for them. The family unit has broken down, and they've allowed that child to go out on the streets and meet up with other children. And like the Lord of the Flies there, what you end up with is you end up with a total rebellion and a disaster. Okay? So we have to guard against that. It's a big job. And he's talking here to the Cretans who have a problem with that. And he says, in your church, make sure they don't do that. Make sure that they look after. And it's the woman that's got the real big responsibility. And I think that's why it's the senior woman that should tell him. Because if I tell him, it's, wow, you're just a guy preaching at me. No, you need to understand how important a womanhood is in a society. You want a strong Canada, it ain't going to be done in Ottawa. I'm sorry, sorry, Justin Trudeau cannot pass any law. He can pass any law that you want, I guess, but that's not going to make it happen. We can put everything on the books that we want, but we're not going to live by the books, are we? Because we have broken down and we're in a disaster mode. We need to get our houses in order and build it. It's like tissue. It's like anything in the body. It's cell by cell by cell. When you get the cells functioning together, you get strong tissue, okay? Same thing. You get the family units together, you can have a strong local uh, society. You get enough of that, you can have a strong nation. So let's do it God's way. So it, it, it's a big, awesome responsibility. The next one, good. They're to be good. Not just keepers at home, they're to be good. Hey, teach your, teach your young ladies to be good. And that means ex it's talking externally about their dealings. It's that um, um, she is to be a person who, who seeks uh, to relate to others uh, by way of God's truth. In other words, make sure when she says something, it's godly and that she stands by it. Good, uh, externally. And then I'll close with this one, and it's the final one here, and that is obedient to their own husbands. Obedient to their own husbands. This is the final quality for which younger women must be taught. Uh, to some, it is the most difficult quality to, to obtain. Remember, if you don't get the other ones before, you're not going to get to this point. Sometimes we want to just skip over everything and get to the point. And we want you to, no, you got to go through this part, this process here. Get to this point where they're obedient to their own husbands. And, uh, I mean, certainly our society sees this as a form of, of imprisonment. And uh, can you imagine going on Oprah or something like that, a woman saying, I'm obedient to my own husband. <gasps> the gasps in the crowd and the women and the, oh, my goodness. And then one of them will get up and walk out or something. They'll be so upset. And yet, if she was sleeping around with other everybody, hey, isn't that nice? What a mess we have in the world today. Let me tell you something, folks. Let's get back to the Word of God. For centuries, women in the church have been treated as second-class citizens. It's no secret. For, for, for centuries, we have pummeled womanhood in the church. And kept them, because the Bible talks about the women, especially when you talk about tongues and stuff like that, they are not to be talking in the church and they're to talk of the, or ask of their own husbands. There are some rules in that. But we got to the point where we took it the other way and we've just used them like they're a second-class citizen and we hammered away at them. And it's like, quiet, woman, or I'll give you a backhand. That's not the way Jesus treated women. And that, I always like to see, okay, Jesus was the perfect man. How did he treat a woman? Man, he had followers who were women, just many as he had men. He was a leader among men. He had the women who, who, who I mean, they, they cared for him. And, and they, he cared because he cared about them. And, of course, you know, the Pharisees were probably upset over that too. But yeah. that's the way they were. They had their religion. And so, true, God does not want women to pastor. He does not. I tell you, if you've got a woman pastor, she's unscriptural. It's wrong. They're not to preach the Word of God. It's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, according to the Word of God. Uh, however, 
And we've looked at some passages here where their teaching is so much, I think, in some ways, more rudimentary, more important, because they're teaching the young women. And as we saw even in, over in Proverbs, some of the young men, how, how, how to live. I mean, I can preach all I want, and you guys hear me, and then you go home. They're going to hear the preaching, godly preaching, best from their moms at home on a regular basis. Things I can't, I can't get through to them on. So, uh, but that said, we have treated, sadly, people, uh, women as second, uh, second class citizens. Um, no, God does not call women to preach, but you know what? God, God hasn't called most of you to preach either. Does that make you a second class citizen in the kingdom of God? Not at all. Not at all. There's nothing, you know, nothing special. Like, again, God's not a respecter of persons. We need to, to heed this. And I got looking at this too, and I, I, I see here that uh, th this uh, means really what it says, obedient to their own husbands. It means willfully placing oneself under subjection to one's own husband. So maybe that's a good reason to pick a nice, uh, nice Christian man, okay? Think about who you're, you're getting involved with. Um, because, again, a lot of women will marry somebody and say, well, I'll change them later. You won't change them later. No, 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 no. In fact, if you're going to be godly, then you're going to have to be subject to this guy. So be careful. You Make sure you pick a guy who's got some, some, some promise on the horizon to, to follow God and to, to help you in that area. Uh, so no one is to force such a response as, uh, as this uh, is to be a sign of spiritual surrender to the will of God, not the will of man. Women are to obey their husbands, not because I'm the man and I say so. No, something more important, because God told them to, and that's why they do it. God wants a spiritual surrender, not a physical threatening surrender. And man, if you've got that kind of a family, you've got a strong, dynamic family going on. Not perfect, challenged all the time, yes, but ready to go and, and to grow spiritually. So, and I, I think about this, about the subjection thing, about, uh, about surrendering. Jesus Christ found it worthy to submit and surrender to the will of the Father in all things. When he came to this earth, he said, not my will, but thine. He goes, I do not, I'm not looking forward to this. I know what's going to happen to me. I'm not looking forward to this. But Father, not my will, yours. That is the example. And what I'm saying is that Jesus is not commanding women to do anything that he has not already done himself about surrendering to God. So this is something that we really have to look at. And, and I mean, even, even so you have the Son submitting to, to the Father, and you have the Holy Spirit surrendering to the Father, and in some occasions it talks about surrendering to the Son. So even within the Godhead, to make it work, there is, there is a, a pecking order, there is a leadership order. And that's, this is God's plan in the household. Again, if you don't like this, folks, you can. It's your will. You can choose to do your own thing your own way and end up like the rest of the world. I don't think they're having a great time out there. They're trying to. They're spending a lot of money out there trying to have a good time. But I don't think it's working too, too well. So, and also, and I'll close with this, in Luke chapter 9, verse 48, Jesus himself taught, He that is least among you all shall be great. He's talking about humility. All right, so this is not meaning that you're a second-class citizen, that you're somebody's doormat. You're not. You're willfully submitting to your own husband, because you're submitting to God. That's what it is. Does your husband deserve it? No, trust me, he does not deserve you. Uh, you're, you're precious rubies, and we do not deserve a godly woman. But praise God, God gives them to us anyway, and we need you. So what I'm going to close with this is these are instructions given to an ungodly society on Crete. Okay, they were, This was not the Jewish religious structure. These people were, you do as you want. They were drinking and having parties on that night long. That was the norm on that island. But for those saved people, God See, said, I want you to speak sound doctrine to the aged men, to the aged women, and instruct the aged women to instruct the younger women how to be as well. Start putting things in order. Let God's blessings flow through you. Don't go with the flow of the world. Oh my goodness, that'll destroy you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. Now, Lord, I, I know that the, this is, uh, it's long and it's drawn out into a, to a certain extent that there, there's so much here in just one chapter, but it, it's hitting all of us. It's hitting wh wh whatever our age or our gender is. There are commands and instructions on how to serve you better, how to be blessed by you and have joy in our lives, how to relate to one another. 
And Father, as we look here today, we see this responsibility of the young women, and I thank you so much for young women who are going to surrender to God and do God's will and have God bless them. But I also ask that you would help the aged women, Lord, those who are mature, who have been through it, to stand by them and to continually pray for them and deal with them and, and give them their counsel. And Lord, that we may see these young women come up into the next generation, Lord, where we see what Christianity is all about in the household. And Father, I thank you so much for your love for us. You loved us so much that you gave us instructions on how to be blessed by you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.